Before I dive into the topic, I just want to talk about myself a little bit okay, so that you can know who I am. So I'm in the tech industry for the last 25 plus years here in Twin Cities. Uh, <coughs> worked at uh, IBM Consulting, so we did a lot of websites from 1998 all the way to 2005. And then I left uh, IBM uh, to <coughs> other consulting firms out here in town. I see a couple of familiar faces here. So I was at Retech, Carlson, Wagonlet Travel, uh, goldpoints.com was my baby at some point of time. Then moved on to United Health Group, unitedadvantage.com, evercarehealthplans.com. There are a lot of digital footprints that I have here in town. Uh, I have zero <coughs> clue about data science two years ago. Uh, and I'm not a data scientist. And I'm not a machine learning engineer. Uh, but I'm a tech, tech guy. But this is how we started at uh, Virtual, which is a division of healthpartners.com. Uh, and so please feel free to stop me if I'm smoking something wrong. But I do have a degree in microprocessor based engineering. So uh, I did work, my thesis was on neural networks and back propagation 26 years ago. Now you all know my age. So <laughs> what, I'm, what I do for fun is I uh, play on Bet365 quite a bit. I don't play cricket. I'm a data analyst on cricket. I do publish quite a few articles. So I don't play. That's the icon that uh, the PowerPoint found for me. Uh, <clears throat> I'm also interested in real estate. So I do have a session. For the very first time, I, I go and talk on AI, uh, a lot of tech stuff. But today evening, I'm going to talk about on real estate for the very first time, because that's my other passion area. OK, I know this is why you guys are here. <laughs> Uh, so this is the Google search trends data uh, on data science. Actually, the numbers are surprisingly exactly the same if you just take the United States or just take Japan or just take the whole board. So it's exponentially increasing. It's the search for AI. And if you do data science, it's exactly the same. So as you can see, the last five years, it's growing up uh, 40 to 50 percent uh, and you can go to indeed.com, dice.com. Uh, approximately, there are 600 job openings here in Twin Cities as of today uh, on this field. Okay? So we are at a super negative unemployment rate uh, in this field. So that's why I'm sure you guys are here. Uh, feel free to stop me if you have questions. We can also talk at the end. So this is some job prediction. Uh, a lot of people ask me, is AI going to disturb a uh, lot of the job industry. Yes, it is. Uh, truck driving may not be a job 25 years from today. Um, well, radiology is getting disrupted. Uh, so there is a lot of disruption happening. But for people who have concerns, I can give you this stats. Uh, 110 years ago, 50% uh, of US population was working on agriculture. Okay, So this half of the room was all working on agriculture. 100 years ago. Uh, today, less than 3% of our population is working in agriculture industry. Uh, the rest of us uh, are not unemployed. The unemployment rate is actually the lowest uh, in the last 25 years or something like that. So yes, the AI will eliminate quite a few jobs, but it will also create some new jobs. And I'm sure that's why we're all here, trying to explore that. Uh, so this is from Statista. Uh, how the AI revenue is growing, or it's going to grow. Uh, in, it's in millions right now, if you look at it, the US market. But it will soon cross billions. Uh, actually, <coughs> Accenture is predicting there is going to be more than $250 billion on the savings side and $300 billion on the earnings side, or, or on the revenue side, in the next 10 years, just on the AI front. Okay. So CB Insights is also predicting the same. Uh, let's look at some savings. So these are some savings numbers. Uh, Business Insider, this was last year. They're saying because of machine learning algorithm, they saved billion dollar in 2017. Uh, I don't know how that is possible, but uh, 
Netflix has published that number, so we gotta believe that. Uh, Amazon's machine learning algorithm is doing click to ship time by more than 200%. So I'm not making up these numbers, guys. This is from Forbes and Business Insider. Uh, health IT analytics, that's what I spend a lot of my time on, because for the last 15 plus years, I'm on the health IT sector. Uh, the deep learning, uh, Google's DeepMind, I don't know how many of you have heard about uh, DeepMind. Uh, the <coughs> company out in the UK, which beat the goal, the biggest, pro, uh, that, that people said like 20 years ago, you cannot write an AI program to defeat uh, Go uh, champions. And uh, the, that's when the DeepMind became pretty cool in 2015 and Google acquired them, and right now, the Google's deep learning algorithm uh, is predicting, it's, it's actually doing a lot more wonders on the IT side. So there is a company, uh, IDXDR, uh, out here in Iowa City, uh, and what they have done is using similar algorithms, the TensorFlow, uh, they are able to <coughs> detect diabetic retinopathy, 8% better than the best radiologists that we have. And they're the first FDA approved complete autonomous AI solution, okay? So the first autonomous AI was supposed to be the self-driving cars. But we have an autonomous AI, FDA approved robotic thing that will come and detect, take your eye, retina picture, and then it will detect you whether you're going to have the diabetic retinopathy, okay? So it's, 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 FD approved, it's already in eight different states right now. And it takes out a six months or three months time frame from an ophthalmologist to a specialized uh, radiology person. So you have to do lots of labs. And then you, before you predict, it takes like three to six months. I don't want to uh, say the total dollar amount to do that in healthcare as of today. Uh, but this machine uh, does it in less than 30 seconds. Okay. This is not some AI crazy picture that I'm talking about. This is already F FDA approved. Okay, so Google has very life, uh, very life, life science. Sorry, very, very life, life science, which is also working on a similar program. Another slide on AI savings. This is from Accenture. So this is the 250, uh, sorry, 150 billion dollars in the next eight years. This is what they're predicting. This is what AI will save. And just on the healthcare alone in United States. So I just highlighted a couple of things in purple because this is a slide that I took from virtual because that's what we are working on on virtual. So that's a $25 billion uh, industry on virtual care uh, and preliminary diagnosis on primary care. So that's, that's a pretty cool industry. So on the other side, <coughs> look at how <coughs> the search has changed, okay? I, I think every one of you already probably know all of these things. And 80% of the time, if you're chatting with somebody, you're not actually chatting with somebody. You're chatting with the system. Um, in 2020, this is Gartner's prediction, 98% of the time they're right. Customers will manage 85% of their relationship with an enterprise without even interacting with a human. Okay? so. This is how the picture is as of today. Now let's shift gears to learn. A lot of people think artificial intelligence is all about robotics or it's all about machine learning, okay? There is so many things like natural language processing, reasoning. Uh, it's, it's just not about learning. There are different kinds of learning too, supervised, unsupervised. I don't want to bore you on all the technology stuff. You can go read about it. That's why you're here, uh, but it's, a lot of people also think about its ability to manipulate or move objects. That's what robotic engineers are working on. But the area is really huge, and machine learning is a small piece, okay? So what's data science? Okay, data science is in existence for a long, long time. Uh, it's it's um, especially statistics, computer science, and the business knowledge. It's marrying all of it. So I want to put to you a big picture. So data science is a huge area. AI is a small piece of data science. Okay, machine learning is a small piece. Have you guys seen the Russian dolls? So the bigger Russian doll is like the data science area. There is one inside. That's the AI doll. And then the next doll, the smaller doll, 
is the machine learning doll. And then the next doll inside the machine learning doll is the deep learning doll. Okay? So don't think that deep learning is AI. Okay? That's actually, yes, it is AI, but not all problems are solved. If you go talk to my folks at Cargill, uh, is anybody from Cargill here? Uh, there are quite a few uh, uh, <coughs> data science folks who are working in Cargill on the uh, chicken farm production. Uh, there is a there is a good one on uh, the squid. What is the the fish? Shrimp. Thank you. Shrimp. See, being, being from the East, I always say shrimp. So shrimp farming uh, has revolutionized the data science team in uh, Cargill. The, the, uh, the, obviously, the food industry has taken this uh, a lot better than the healthcare industry. Um, but if you go talk to those guys. Uh, the other one is actually targets and best buys, isn't it? So they have already implemented these kind of things five, ten years ago, uh, and they're making predictive analytic decisions in Best Buy, also in Target. Uh, believe it or not, banking industry is doing this for a long time. We all know that. Uh, now healthcare industry has started looking into this. Okay, so let's let's just the, this is a great picture that uh, I just drew for one of our teams here. So it's AI is a lot of smaller bubbles. I didn't put all the small bubbles here. So uh, robotics is one small bubble, image recognition, video uh, processing, so now speech recognition. So there is actually an algorithm right now. It takes your video, and then after 10 minutes of how you move around and do things, it can take any audio and put it there into your video, and then it can uh, do that kind of manipulation. So. I don't know what it will do to our politics in the future, but, but that's all exciting stuff happening out there. Then it's the speech recognition is all already there. We all know because most of us are doing the searches through our speech devices. Image recognition has taken us to the next level, and that's where it's disrupting the radiology industry. Uh, and then a lot of ophthalmology is changing because of that. And the machine learning is a, another small bubble inside there. And predictive analytics, all, we, we all work on descriptive analytics. Isn't it? People all know what descriptive analytics is. I'm sure you guys have some software like Tableau in your company that you take the existing data and manipulate it and present it to your business folks and make your living. But what the future is, how you can take it to predict things, and then how can you take that to prescribe things. So predictive analytics, and then move on to prescriptive analytics. This is not rocket science because already people are doing here. And deep learning is another small bubble inside. But this is another uh, professor at Northeastern University. So I like his way of explaining what data science is. So he, uh, uh, to me, my view is a little bit bigger than this, but this is his view. It's, it's about collecting data. How do you shape the data? How do you store it? Uh, how do you manage it, analyze it? And then you have to make some data-driven decisions based on all of that data. Okay. So all the Amazon purchases and the last couple of years of Target purchases, Amazon has been doing this for 10 plus years, while Targets and Best Buy's have been doing it for two plus years. Uh, so f Facebook feeds, so a lot of Netflix, Netflix pioneered this recommendation engine. Um, so that kind of disrupted a lot of industry. Uh, and now the facial recognition is also in build. So these are some examples of uh, the AI stuff. So this is my way of understanding. Uh, predictive analytics is a bigger bubble. Uh, and then there's uh, the, the traditional databases. Uh, and then the big data, like the Apache, Kafka, the streaming, and all that is that yellow bubble that you cannot read out there. Uh, it, it, is, it is coming. It will become red in the future. And then there is a lot of high performance computing. So all of this married together, there is a central bubble, isn't it? So that's where a lot of newer algorithms are popping up. And that's uh, that's the deep neural net stuff, and that's deep learning. OK. Before we dive into like what data scientists need, like how do you grow your skills, I just want to do a comparison of a regular web team uh, and then how that translates to a data science team. Because a lot of us know how web and mobile work, isn't it? So it's, it's a little bit easier if you can look at it this way. So a web mobile team, the chief technology uh, person leads the uh, organization or all the products under that company uh, in a data science team is the chief digital officer or chief analytics officer. Some company calls it a CDO, some call it a CAO. 
you have a product owner here, you do have a product owner there. You do have business analysts over here, you do have business analysts also on the other side, you also have data analysts. Uh, you have software architects, you have somebody called data architects on the other side. You want designers and front-end engineers who can make things feel appeal to your end consumers, your customers. Uh, yes, you do have data visualizers on the other side. Uh, you have software engineers, multiple software engineers probably in a team uh, from web mobile team, uh, and you have machine learning engineers on the other uh, side. So senior software expert on this side or senior software engineer, some call it a software analysts or whatever, so that's on the other side, they, they are the data scientists, okay? So a lot of people think that it is, you take a bunch of data scientists and then put them together in a room and it's going to solve the problem, okay? That is not going to happen, guys, okay? You cannot have five Kobe Bryants in a team and you cannot win, win championship. That, that doesn't work like that. And actually, if you put five Kobe Bryants together, we all know what's going to happen, isn't it? What's the number one problem when you have five PhDs working together? Huh? Yep. So I'm not against PhDs, don't get me wrong, but everybody has, they're so passionate about solving, but then they are like so passionate in that one direction, okay? So you can read about, there, there is a book, Captain Class, I don't know how many of you have read about Captain Class, it uh, was Sam, does anybody, can anybody Google that? Captain Class was a book which talks about uh, sports teams, the most successful sports teams in the last 100 years, or last 80 years or something, okay? Uh, and it's, 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 it's not about the individual top lead scientists, it's not about the captain, it's just not about the coach, it's how the teams are formed and how people play different roles, okay? So what I want you guys to, when you leave today, don't think that to break into a data science team, you need to be a data scientist. So you can pick any of these areas on the other side. We still need a, a DevOps uh, cloud engineer on a data science team too. So I've, I've interviewed quite a bit of data science teams out here in town. Uh, and the folks who have only the machine learning engineers and data scientists, they are able to get a prototype up and running, but then it never gets it out into the production board. Uh, so you need to have a team, and everybody brings different things to the uh, table. Uh, so I can guarantee you a data scientist is not going to be the best data visualizer, isn't it? Maybe very rarely. Uh, Kobe Bryant can also play defense, but it's very rare. You cannot have uh, um, several of those. So let's just talk about regular business analyst. This is... Some, some teams are calling it as data analysts too, but there is a difference here. So these are the traditional business analysts in a traditional web mobile team. Uh, the data scientist usually lacks this business domain expertise, isn't it? and these folks bridge the gap. Uh, and they, they can give a lot of uh, analysis stuff to the data analyst. So they, they are like kind of the bridge between the doers and the business team. If you really look at the product owner, it gives directions and the business analyst breaks it into tickets, in other, other words. So you, you definitely need to have some kind of a SQL skill or a business intelligence skill, get into Tableau or get into Google Analytics or Web Trends, pull data, and so that's what these people do. Well, data analysts, they have to have some kind of a programming language like everybody probably knows, either you need to know Python or R, JavaScript because it's the UI stuff that for presentation layers, some kind of a visualization skill. Uh, some companies call them as data analyzers. So these are uh, data visualizers. So they collect data. Okay, so they uh, interpret data. So they're kind of the plumbers, isn't it? Imagine if you're doing uh, a bathroom remodeling, isn't it? So uh, I call the data scientists are the tigers. They, they are the most expensive people. Uh, you can't just recruit them to do all the stuff. You still need a plumber, okay? They, they, they need to run the ins and outs of plumbing and the data analysts are the good people who do that kind of job. Um, and then you still need to have some kind of a painter at the end. So those are data visualizers. It doesn't have to be the 
it, it is a different role. It doesn't have to be different people, but the same people can play different roles. So let's move on to machine learning engineer. Okay, so this is like combining a software engineer can actually become a machine learning engineer if you know Python and Scala or Python or R or Scala, so not necessarily all of it. Uh, a lot of people ask me, why, why not Java? Uh, the unfortunately, the libraries in Python for uh, statistics are really cool, isn't it? So Java is not meant for that. Uh, so there are certain things which are really good uh, on the Italian side of food, and there are certain things on the Mexican side. Then it's just don't try to take the Mexican spices and apply it to your pasta. It's not going to work. Maybe one or two people might like it, but that's not the majority of us. Okay, so that's how I, I look at it. So Python is not rocket science. Uh, not, it's very easy to pick it up. Uh, so it's uh, and then these algorithms are already available. So you're not creating these complicated algorithms. And maybe that's what a data scientist does. There are like 200 algorithms already written for you in Python. This is like going and finding a library in Rails or Grails or, uh, or Groovy or Ruby. If you're a software programmer, you're, you're, you're not reinventing everything. I mean, it's already cooked for you somewhere. Uh, and you, you need to just go use it. And that's what building a model is all about. Uh, you, you need to have a little bit of probability, stats, knowledge. Yes, that's all really critical for uh, doing some kind of predictive analytics. So switching gears, this is the data architect. I'm sure a lot of companies have big data uh, engineers. Some companies call it as big data architects. Some call it as data architect. Uh, so large amounts of data. If, you, if you're working on a hospital system, there are like so many sensors on a hospital. We, we have like millions of data points that comes to us every minute. It's, it's not about like uh, millions in an hour. It's like millions in like two seconds sometimes. So you need to have like somebody who have uh, Spark or Hadoop kind of uh, an expertise to like take all of the data and make some meaning, meaning out of it. So it's just not about the regular data warehousing. And so that is, that's gone. Believe it or not, we have three connected devices per human today. Okay, so there are more than 20 billion <coughs> connected devices today, and it's going to explode. Okay, it's going to explode. Hopefully the population doesn't explode like that. But, uh, but the device explosion is really huge, and then the protocol explosion is really huge. So you've got to have some kind of big data engineers in your team to make some meaningful. Uh, so. So there is a slight difference between a data engineer and a data architect. So it's a different role. Some say it's the same. It's the skill set is very, uh, very, very similar. Uh, if you if you know MATLAB and Hive, Pig, I don't know whether it's a data architect or a data engineer. You can argue it both ways. But then this is the data scientist. So you you don't need to have like. A team of data scientists working together, obviously, yes, you need to. Like if you go look into Cargill, they have like specialized data scientist team on each of these teams, isn't it? So they have a crop, spe specific crop, they work on it. The chicken farm, they have a couple of data scientists uh, because they, they, they manage like thousands of chicken farms all across the world. Okay, so there is this person who is working on the shrimp farm. So there are a couple of data scientists on that one. Uh, at United Health Group over in Edinburgh, they have quite a few, at the Optum, they have quite a few data scientists working on different kinds of problems on the health plan side. Um, at Health Partners, we are, we are working mostly on the health care delivery side, okay? So these are different, different kind of people. Um, but data scientists, they, they do much more than just machine learning, isn't it? Uh, it's, it's, a lot of people think it is all about using the right algorithm and get the stuff out there. It's about pre-processing the data, the data cleansing and making. The good data is very, very essential, isn't it? Otherwise, garbage in, garbage out. We all know that, isn't it? It's, it's what you eat is what you are, okay? It's what you learn is what you are. So uh, that's exactly true, unfortunately true here. Okay, now. Let's switch gears to what are all the different e-learning uh, 
uh, or regular learning uh, before I dive in? Qu any questions? It looks like I'm the one who's talking about. Yeah. Data architect. I'm sure there is a data architect who can answer that. Yes? Yeah. I, I, I think uh, that's a great question. That's a great question. So JSONs and probably it should be um, GraphQL, okay? So that's what it, it is moving to. But unfortunately, this slide was copied from a healthcare part of it. And healthcare, uh, it, they just moved into XML like three years ago. XML is something new. If you're talking to somebody in uh, a finance side of things, XML is still true, isn't it? Uh, Unfortunately, at the health care side, a lot of data still resides in, not even in SQL. Okay, so <coughs> they're still in the 1970s or 80s. <laughs> now you know why healthcare is expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Little tidbit for you. Yep, yep. But yeah, it, it has to be GraphQL, isn't it? That's where it is moving. Um, does it answer your question? Thanks. Yeah. Maybe I'll update it, add all those things. E-learning, any other stuff before? How many of you guys know about Coursera? Very good. Yeah, this is, this is, this is the future, isn't it? Like if you have to go learn something. Uh, so the one that I love, there are hundreds of courses in Coursera. For people who do not know what Coursera is, it's an e-learning platform and a lot of real university professors, real universities, okay? When I say real stuff like University of Michigan to like Stanford to MIT, they open source their whole program out there. So you can just go take it. If you want a little certificate at the end of it, you just pay like 50 bucks or 100 bucks or 25 bucks, some, some peanuts. And if you are in any enterprise in Twin Cities, uh, they will obviously write that check for you for because you are investing a lot of time in learning. So a couple of years ago, I took the uh, Stanford online course. Uh, that was like 15 weeks from Andrew Ng, so who's one of the pioneers in the AI uh, course. It is, it is one of the really sought out courses in Coursera. Uh, very good course. Guys, I have three masters program across three different continents, uh, and that was a freaking tough one. Okay, it's not, <laughs> you cannot just smoke it. Uh, I've smoked quite a few tests in my previous careers very easily, <laughs> but that's not easy. But it's good stuff though, it's really good. A uh, couple of my folks took the John Hopkins one and they said it's really, really good. Uh, so these ones, you can take it at home. The discussion forums are really, really cool. You get to like meet people, I mean, not meet in person, uh, meet people across like different countries. Uh, and my buddy was from Egypt or somewhere, uh, and he was helping me quite a bit. And then I later on found out he was like 20 years younger than me. But that doesn't matter, isn't it? Like you, 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 you learn, you can, you can learn from anyone. Uh, but the, the good part is these discussion forums are really useful. <coughs> And these are real university professors, and you can access them for free. And I don't know how many of us are utilizing it, because 18% of Coursera people are from United States. 96% of Coursera courses are from United States. So the rest of the world is utilizing it, is what I'm saying. Because you can apply the simple data logic in there. But uh, these are the top four that our team liked. So I just put it out there, Stanford, uh, John Hopkins, uh, and there is this University of Washington, Michigan. Uh, so these are, and there are hundreds more. This is just not, this is just what we uh, went and took, some of us. Okay, <clears throat> how many of you know about Udacity? So this is another competition to, this is also free. This is from different universities also. It's a competition to uh, Coursera and they have hundreds of courses and if you want to take uh, a specific course I would recommend like inferential statistics. 
prescriptive analytics, you can take it in Udacity. Udacity has like the uh, breakdown into like minor modules, a lot of smaller stuff. Uh, and then you can also take it on healthcare prescriptive analytics. Uh, health analytics, something inside hospitals, there is a course for that. Uh, you cannot find that in Coursera. So if you're, let's say, working in uh, uh, agriculture industry, there are like <coughs> hundreds of specific courses on there. And all of this, you can do it from your home. Uh, and obviously, you need a couple of softwares, but a lot of it is open source. Believe it or not, you, it's, it's all free. Okay. You're dummy. You're dummy is like folks like us who put this thing together. Okay, these are not professors. Sometimes I like Udemy kind of courses because this is real business people putting some courses. And these are like 20 bucks. You can download the whole thing in Coursera and Udacity. So what you need to do is like sign up. It's a 15 week course or 12 week course or 18 week. And you, you have to like log in and do these assignments, especially the one uh, from Stanford. You need to upload the assignment and then they'll give you test data. It'll work in test data, but if you upload it, they put it against real data and then they come back and say, you failed miserably. <laughs> okay, so then they, you don't have the access to that data because they, ha they have it. So they give you a couple of data sets that your program might work. Then you need to go debug, go look into the discussion forum. So that's why I said like you have to spend some hours learning it, but it's fun. Uh, this one is if you want to do it all by yourself and if you can speed up because a couple of my guys over in my team, they like the hands-on Python and R and data science and they downloaded the whole uh, 100 hours worth of video and then they, they wrote something to like piecemeal it into like 20 useful hours of that 100 hours. I, I don't know. But, but for me, uh, if I want to spend, I want to spend the 100 hours, not in a given week, isn't it? I want to spend like 10 hours a, uh, a week, max, because I have rest of things happening. But it, it depends on you. So if you like Udemy, I would say, just go get this course. You can, you can download like for, if you spend 100 bucks, you can download like 20 different courses. Okay, these are video tutorials, nicely done. Some, are, some have real good ratings and you can read the ratings and reviews and you can finally do your project in, inside Udemy and say that these are the top three courses or something. Okay, lynda.com used to be really good but now it's part of LinkedIn. And LinkedIn is, uh, LinkedIn is uh, part of Microsoft, so I'll stop there. So, but uh, they have good courses there too on big data. Uh, I, I really like the one from, uh, New Zealand professor who wrote something on uh, how to grow your data science team. So all the, it, it's still still free, even though it's part of Microsoft. That's kind of interesting. And I'm sure it is it is coming. Uh, <coughs> Edureka is another company, and this I think it's based out in India or Singapore, somewhere in the uh, east. Uh, but these programs are a little pricier. Okay. But they're done really nicely well, and they have certification at the end of it. And these tests are not that easy to take, okay? I don't know how many of you know this. If you, if you go to Math Olympiad, the top five teams are always from Singapore. Okay, go figure that. Uh, <coughs> so the, the, those are the guys who are writing this uh, certification course material. So I don't think so it's easy to crack it, but they have like 20 on Python alone, okay? 500 to $1,000 or something like that. Still a lot cheaper than enriching <coughs> some other universities, but it's a good program. EDX is what I personally love. If you want to join teams like ours, we look into what did you do in EDX because they have a curriculum. So they have like six sets of programs, for instance, the top one, the data science one, okay? So it's a 12 week intro to Python, then 12 weeks on this, then 12 weeks on this, then 12 weeks on this. Then you get a postgraduate diploma from University of San Diego 
or you get a postgraduate diploma from Harvard, okay? These are not expensive, like 1,400 to two grand, but this takes a year or year and a half or two years of commitment. Uh, and this is a really, a couple of our guys did from UC San Diego. Uh, one of our person also did it from Georgia Tech. And I'm, I'm debating about doing it from Harvard or Georgia Tech, but these are good programs. Okay, future loan. Uh, if you're tired of United States, uh, and if you want to like explore what the heck is happening in Australia, New Zealand, China, uh, there are professors from this part of the world who are also teaching, okay? Or from, uh, if you want to like, no, I want to learn from Cambridge, UK. This is where you go, and they also have good programs. Believe it or not, uh, there are a couple of professors from Israel who are teaching in Future Learn, who's whose classes, even though this is online, it gets filled up so fast, they can only take 1,000 at a time. So it fills up in two minutes. And these guys are from Israel, and they have some good, cool products, and they, it's a real data that you will work on. Okay, so. Uh, so I'm tired of going to all these places. There is a thing called Class Central. If you type in a specific thing in Class Central, they have aggregated all of these four things. This is like one, one place to shop, isn't it? What are, what are those called as? The aggregators. Uh, and then they will say like, okay, this is the best in Coursera. So Class Central has tied up with all these four guys, EDX, yeah, Udacity, Future Bond. So you can just go do this. Uh, Emeritus, this is another f thing from Singapore and the uh, universities out here in the US. Um, so if you want to do like applied machine learning from Columbia Engineering, uh, these are a little pricier, these are like a year long course, or you can do it from MIT Sloan. Sitting, sitting here guys. All of these things are e-learning, whatever I'm talking about so far. So you, you will have something from MIT Management or UC Berkeley uh, sitting here in Twin Cities. Okay, so for some people, this is not the right way to do it. So I want to go to the university and then learn the old school way, which is also not bad because St. Thomas has four programs, U of M has four programs, and actually the, the College of uh, uh, St. Saint Scholastica, their program is getting rave reviews lately. Hamlin has started one, Bethel has also started one, okay? But I am sure those things are super pricier as of today but you will have your ROI once you're done with any of these courses. So just to leave you with your uh, thought, successful data science teams, they don't have 10 data scientists working together, okay, none of them, except maybe in Google. Uh, even in Google, they do kill quite a few of data science teams, you can go read about it. So you need to have like a good product owner, solve a business problem, and follow some agile process, like put something out there in prod, relearn it, and then uh, adjust your learnings and apply again, and then move forward. So that's, that's the most successful model. After talking to quite a few of my folks over here in town, that's what I figured out. And you need to have some kind of a cloud engineer ready because you need to scale up, you need to have GPUs sometimes. Uh, you can't just like keep on adding machines because none of none of us have unlimited resources. So you have to have some kind of a strategy on that one too. So a lot of successful data science teams have like a good product owner plus a good DevOps engineer handy. It's just not about machine learning. Okay, so you could still be part of a DevOps uh, team and then be in a data science team too. So that's that's my message. And always start small and enjoy. So let's get into some Q and A. Thanks, guys. <coughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Um, how would you, a little bit orthogonal, but how yeah. would you go about advocating that your company at a data science team when they very, very clearly need to? I'm in a situation where you have a data scientist, a trained data scientist with a degree working like an hourly job at our company who wants to work in data science, and we're having a heck of a time advocating to get started. Yes, he's entry level, but I have a little bit of knowledge of what's going on. Kay. How would you suggest you approach that? Perfect question. Let me take Virtual as an example. I don't know how many of you have heard about Virtual. It's a local uh, startup, started eight, 
and a half years ago, uh, funded by Health Partners. So we are in telehealth space, okay? Uh, we connect patients with clinicians remotely. So two years ago, our traffic is multifolding year over year, 30 to 40 times from previous year to the next year because people are moving to high detectable plant. So we need to put clinicians behind the scenes. We treat 100 different conditions, skin specialists, birth control people, to STD, to sinus infection. Okay, so you need to figure out how many people are going to come tomorrow from 9 to 11, isn't it? So we were loading up our behind the scenes, we will have like 50 to 100 doctors working on a schedule. So two years ago, we took this problem and said like, we have to do some kind of a time series forecasting to figure out this. And then the team said like, we are, we are okay in what we are doing because we, have, we can load up these 50 docs behind the scenes and the treatment plan can be offered in 30 minutes or less, isn't it? But you keep on adding these docs behind the scenes, it's very expensive for us. So we put together a small prototype we said, if you plug and play these kind of numbers in this software, you will see the difference. So today, uh, we have a lot better scheduling algorithm because of predicting that. So then we put together a full model, and now we have a team, and then we are now taking this to other call centers. Like, can we solve this problem in this call center? Because it's the same problem, isn't it? There are hundreds of call center people, but there are only two specialized people. Do I need 10 specialized person tomorrow? So you take this problem, you extrapolate it, you explain it to the business, then they say, okay, you have to start small, show something in a small team, uh, and then take it to the next level. So that's what we did, it worked for us. So now we are expanding. In, in essence, demo something the business. Sees oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So the, 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 current, the current model is in always in spreadsheet, isn't it? 90% of the companies, they have some kind of an Excel we, which they still fall in love with and they want to enrich Microsoft stock. That's perfectly fine, but you have to, you have to move away from that, but you have to show some value uh, uh, to that. So, yeah, yes sir. That, that's true with any growth project, isn't it? You can't just see the value of it on year one, okay? So you have to, you have, to have like a three-year plan. So that's how we forecast it. That also was a forecasting. Like, okay, this is how we are growing. So in three years, if you do this much with this existing spreadsheet, you need to have like 10 people look into the spreadsheet and you, you'd be have calling up providers to like take up these shifts. And so instead, if you do this, and this is what this is going to do you in three years from today. So you invest this, your break even point will be three years from now or four years from now. And after that, whatever you get is the fruits of all the hard labor that you put in. So that's where this algorithm really helps because you put that algorithm and then it predicts you what the future is going to look like. So it's historical data plus some new data that you put in will give you all that. So that's, I mean, that, that's what we did at Health Partners. I'm not saying that's the right approach. I mean, some, for some, it might break even in six months. Any other questions, guys? I know we are. Plus the cloud.
Great. Like, not, not late, a lot, lot of newer companies are looking into what kind of courses have you done. Like, in fact, that's, that's some of the interview questions that you will encounter if you go to Optum or uh, our team at your partners. And it's a constant learning too. Yeah. yeah. Any? Yes. Sir. Okay, question. Yeah. Um, what do you think about because uh, uh, if you want to consider as a data science, that the person should have a background of statistics or mathematical. So, so to become a machine learning. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. When you come to your point, when you are at the coding side, what kind of person do you look for as a data scientist? So, so for a data scientist, yes, you need to have some kind of a stats background. Uh, but for the rest of the job titles, like for machine learning engineer, you can learn stats. Right. So, I mean, you, if you're a software engineer, uh, you learn like linear algebra mm -hmm. by taking one of these courses. A couple of my team members uh, who are machine learning engineers, they just took those courses. They became familiarized with themselves with stats. But to become a data scientist, you obviously need to go through some good program which takes you through stats uh, at a larger scale, okay? Uh, so the way I explain it is we, are li uh, we can also do the tiling at your home, bathroom, uh, but there are some specialized tiles, you know, those still the matrix pattern and all that. That's not gonna be the stuff that you and me can learn at this point in time. And maybe if we invest a lot of time, we can learn that skill. And that's where those specialized skills, those kind of uh, folks will come in handy. So you don't need like 10 data scientists to solve a problem. You need one or two data scientists to solve that kind of problem. But you need to have like multiple machine learning engineers. So your team needs one software architect, but they need a lot of software engineers isn't it? Right. to like get a website out of door. That's the way you have to look at it. So don't think that you need to become a data scientist to get into this team is, 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 my, is my underlying message from this. <laughs> because, because I have done the Stanford certificate on yeah, yeah. learning, but, but my background is not a statistics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my, my, mine is neither, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't, don't spend time learning about Bayesian algorithm. Okay, that's not going to be our cup of tea. Right, that's, right. That's, that's super complicated. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm, I'm sure, the, the don't get offended if you, if you are, <laughs> go ahead and learn about it, but uh, yeah, that's, that's not what is appetizing for me. I have to solve a problem, and these algorithms are already are implemented. I'm not questioning how it's implemented. I'm just taking it, using it, isn't it? Right. So you, you don't need to know how the freaking car uh, operates underneath the hood, isn't it? The car works, so just take it, drive it, go watch a YouTube video, huh? don't smash anyone. But just learn. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Perfect.